Hey everyone, my name is Matthew Griffin. Today we're going to be having a look at the the future of warfare, kind of 2050 sort of era. Now behind me is the USS Kidd, basically designation DD-61. It was commissioned in 1943, was decommissioned in 1945, recommissioned in the 60s, decommissioned in the 60s, and it's actually named after Admiral Kidd, who was the first commander to be killed in Pearl Harbor on the bridge of the Arizona. Now when we start having a look at the era that this ship belonged to, it was really the battleship era. We then moved to the aircraft carrier era, you know, so Nimitz class, etc., etc. These massive, monstrous $13 billion sovereign cities on the seas, if we want to sort of call them that. Um, and we kind of moved basically from the battleship era basically to the era of massive platforms, the F 35 systems, aircraft carriers, and so on and so forth. Now, in 2023, Typically, sort of during the Ukraine war, basically, we're actually starting to see the move basically to what we call the post platform era. Now, what we actually mean by the post platform era is as we start seeing the proliferation of hypersonic missile systems, drone swarms, and so on and so forth, many people in military circles are actually questioning the viability and the defendability basically of things like aircraft carriers. Because when you have a look at, for example, the Chinese DF 17 hypersonic missile system, which is capable of traveling at Mach 5-ish. It's actually been called the aircraft carrier killer, um, simply because basically the missiles move so fast basically that no system on Earth today is able to defend against a hypersonic missile system. Now, there are a couple of new defensive systems coming through. So, for example, in China, basically, they're actually starting to use 6G technology, which is a terahertz technology to penetrate the cloak of hypersonic missile systems so they can actually see them firstly and then plot out their trajectory using artificial intelligence. Um, in the US though, basically a little while ago, uh, there were calls basically to develop a fully autonomous artificial intelligence defense system that was capable of identifying hypersonic missiles and because they move so fast and so rapidly, a lot, in the, a lot of people in the US military believed that there was no way that humans could intervene or should intervene in destroying these systems. So that's basically why it was tabled with the US Navy a little while ago, about a year ago, that we should actually have an artificially intelligent autonomous defensive system, that's it, which would be put on sort of systems like these. Now, when we actually have a look at the future of destroyers, basically we've got the Zumwalt class of stealth destroyers. Now they're semi-autonomous. They've got a relatively small crew compared to what this would have had. However, if the crew on a Zumwalt class carrier is all killed, so allegedly, according to companies like Raytheon, it's possible that they could actually go to full autonomy. Now, what that means is you could actually have a $4 billion American destroyer that is fully autonomous. Now. When we start thinking about autonomy, on the one hand, we've got smaller ships that are fully autonomous, like minesweepers, for example, which are being sort of fielded by DARPA. But then in the Middle East, with countries like Bahrain, Qatar, as well as other Middle Eastern countries and the US, the first drone fleet is now taking shape. And the drone fleet is a small fleet of fully autonomous vehicles, carriers, you know, sort of ships and so on and so forth, basically that's able to actually do whatever it needs to do. Now, when we start having a look at drones, basically we've got drones basically that drop hand grenades on tanks, we've got drones with machine guns, we've got drones that act in swarms, we've got semi-autonomous drones that act in swarms, we also have increasingly autonomous drones that act in swarms, and actually over in China, basically the Chinese are trying to develop drones that are capable of hypersonic flight that are then also capable of operating in swarms. So those are drone hypersonic drone swarms. Um, well, when we have a look at things like the US Marines, the F-35 system, etc, etc, as well as British Aerospace, basically we've got uh, what we call drone wingmen. So that's basically where you'd have a, a traditional human pilot in an F-35 cockpit doing whatever he or she needs to do, um, but telepathically controlling a whole variety of different drones basically around them. Now, whether that would be used for IIR, for example, reconnaissance, basically, or military activities, it's up to you know, the, the particular mission parameters of the time. 
Um, and then those drones themselves are able to increasingly be autonomous as well. So we're sort of tag teaming humans basically with brain machine interfaces, artificial intelligence, drones, and then drones basically with semi or fully autonomous capabilities. Now, when we start moving beyond that, basically we've already got the development of direct energy weapons systems. So these are essentially just laser weapons. Now, these are being fielded by Northrop Grumman. Uh, they're also being fielded by companies like Lockheed. They're putting on, they're being put onto things like Strikers. Uh, they're going to be put onto things like the F-35s. Um, We've also got, basically just on that note, we've also got the F-16 fleet, which at the moment is sort of being turned into a semi-slash-fully autonomous drone fleet as well. Um, so that's thousands of F-16s, basically, which could end up being really quite advanced drones. Um, and then when we start having a look further out, basically we've actually got companies like DARPA. So DARPA is the bleeding edge research arm of the US military that are actually using the brain waves from human gamers to teach robots better battlefield strategy, which is just nuts when you think about it. And then when we talk about strategy, we've actually got a variety of artificial intelligences like those from Caltech that, and this sounds weird, but are really good at playing poker. Now with poker, basically, you have to be able to figure out what your opponent is doing. It's kind of a game of bluff. It's a game of imperfect knowledge. But with Caltech, these AIs are now starting to be used in battlefield simulations and battlefield strategy, because in a battlefield environment, we don't have perfect knowledge. And then moving on from that, basically we've got, again, DARPA actually starting to turn humans, basically, into what we call living sensors, as well as marine creatures into living sensors. So I'll deal with the marine creatures first. So thanks to the wonders of genetic engineering, so technologies like CRISPR, we're increasingly able to use synthetic biology to genetically engineer plants and animals and everything else that can pick up, for example, things like radio frequencies, and then they can do something with that. Uh, in the case of some plants, they can actually send an email, which just sounds crazy, um, but you know, you can go and Google that one. Go and Google um, spinach, is, spinach plants that send emails. There you go, that's a weird one. Um, so we're moving into this era of living sensors for animals, plants and organisms, but when we actually talk about living sensors with humans, Increasingly, again, we're able to tie up battlefield intelligence, basically, with um, with soldiers. So, for example, if I if I'm a soldier here, and this is my point of view, and there's another soldier that's over there, he or she's got a different point of view. Then, using camera systems, we can use artificial intelligence to tie all of that visual acuity together and that visual information together to create a battlefield picture. So while I can see maybe the back end of a Humvee, my colleague over there might see the front end of a Humvee and we might know that the Humvee is going off to go and do something. So this is where we start turning human warriors basically into living sensor networks to do new things. Now on the, fee, on the topic of robots, you know, we see a lot of robot technologies being deployed already across in the military. The US military has already actually started training drills basically to figure out how to actually take out robots. Um, albeit that they're fairly basic at the moment, basically they are semi-autonomous, they're not really fully autonomous yet, we're not quite talking Terminator but we are kind of getting that, getting that way, that's a topic for maybe a different blog. Um, but yeah, when we actually have a look at the future of warfare, increasingly it's asymmetric, then we've got cyber, so for example, you know, this would not be cyber hardened at all. So when we have a look at cyber, basically we've got robo-hacking that's now going on, we've got artificial intelligences that are able to probe Pentagon systems, basically identify exploits and then say, do you want me to patch it or hack it? Um, we have all kinds of different things basically going on in the cyber field. And all of that just shows you how far we have come in the 80 years since the USS Kidd, designation DD-661, was commissioned. And if this is how far we've actually come in 80 years, bearing in mind that we are now accelerating still and we, everything is changing at an even faster rate, then just imagine what I'd be talking about if I was actually sitting here in another 80 years time. So I hope you enjoyed that. Take care. Uh, subscribe. Like stuff. Don't care. Um, but uh, see you soon. Take care. Goodbye.